If you have your Bibles, uh, I would that you turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at two verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in the NIV. I hear the pages flipping, so we'll wait for a second. All right. Okay. And here's how it reads, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 in the NIV. It says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. For the next little while, my brothers and sisters, I'd like to speak to you from this subject and from this wise, selected, sealed, and safe. Selected, sealed, and safe. In July 1941, a man escaped from the cruel concentration camp at Auschwitz. As a result of any one person escaping that concentration camp, there was only one command that 10 people, as a result of that one person, would starve to death. The tenth and final person on this particular day was a man by the name of Gajanicic. And when Gajanicic's name was selected out of all these people to die, it is recorded that he said, my children, my wife, my wife, and my children, my wife, and my children, over and over again as he sobbed uncontrollably, my wife and my children. There was another prisoner there who was a Catholic priest, but also a prisoner because he was a Jew. He heard Gajanich sobbing and speaking, my wife and my children. He did not know Gajanich. He was a complete stranger. But this stranger walks up to the commander of the guards with a simple request. May I take his place? The request was simple, but how difficult was it to do such a thing? After making that request, the captain of the guard mulled over to a moment and he consented. He said, yes, you can take his place. And they exchanged places. One was left to live and another left to die. <laughs> and it was recorded later on in an interview that God Nietzsche said these words. He said, I, the condemned, am to live because someone else willingly and voluntarily offered his life for me, a stranger. And through the actions of a stranger, a prisoner who was once condemned was now selected, sealed, and safe. And much like Gajanicic, Paul identifies three things that our God does for us. He says God anointed us. He put his seal on us. And he put his spirit in us. And I've come to appreciate and understand the biblical power of the number three. There's a special anointing, Pastor O, in E, in three, in three. God identifies himself in three distinct roles, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in these three distinct roles are three distinct responsibilities. The Father loves us, the Son redeems us, and the Spirit keeps us. But there's one set of three that'll make you and me shout all over the place, and that is that the Bible records for us that Jesus Christ died on a hill called Calvary. Day one nailed him. 
Day two held him, but day three expelled him. <laughs> because the creation can never contain the creator, the power of three. Let's set the scene now with a little background information. The book of 2 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth and is a continuation of his first letter, further revealing the highs and the lows of his relationship with this church. Theirs was a classic case of man's will versus God's will. Man's way versus God's way, or here it is, religion versus relationship. Dr. Tony Evans says that religion is man's way of trying to get to God, but on man's terms. Pastor Bill Parker told us last month that religion is the external void of the internal. And I like to put it this way, religion is much like drinking a Coca-Cola. It's satisfying going down, but at the end of the day, it's nothing more than empty calories. And when Paul brought the gospel of Corinth to the city of Corinth, which was, uh, um, it was a city in southern Greece, he soon discovered that this city was wealthy, cosmopolitan, and commercial. In other words, their pockets were deep, their influence was distinguished, and they had an undeniably strong business district. And by the grace of God, Paul was able to introduce the gospel to this busy and bustling city. But due to their cultural differences and the religious influences of this melting pot, Paul had to fight to connect with their conscience. And he had to clarify their misconceptions about Christianity. One of the issues that, and problems that they were having was that of factionalism. Now, factionalism is where groups of people claimed their allegiance to a person. It looked like this. Some would say, we follow Paul. Others would say, well, we follow Apollos. Some still would say, we follow Cephas. And the super saints would say, well, we don't follow any of them. We only follow Christ. <laughs> but Paul rebukes every last one of those and he says to them, while you should be connected and committed, what I find is that you are contentious and confused. And to this very day, there's a lot of contention and confusion in the body of Christ. And this need to clarify our Christianity is more evident than ever. And I'd argue, my brothers and sisters, that the primary reason that Christians are fumbling over godly principles is because there is an abandonment of truth from the pulpit. Preachers today tend to shy away from hot-button issues. And they do it for three primary purposes and reasons. Popularity, pews, and the purse. <laughs> you see, preaching biblical principles is not popular. Therefore, it has the propensity to negatively affect the pews, and empty pews equates to an empty purse. So what do the people do? Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll find out what the people do. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Here's what the people do. Paul tells young Timothy, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. <laughs> Paul tells young Timothy, he says, son, you may not experience what I'm writing you about. Right now, the gospel is still new. It's still hot on the press, and people are accepting Jesus Christ, and they are following him. But I'd like to let you know 
from a prophetic standpoint that the day and time is coming where people will no longer put up with sound doctrine. And if Paul were standing here today in 2022, he would no longer say the people would not put up with sound doctrine. He would let us know that we are no longer putting up with sound doctrine. But not only were they not putting up with sound doctrine and the time was coming that the people would not put up with it, but he also says, he says, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Um, an author by the name of, of, of Josh Becker, um, I, I don't know his, his theology, I don't, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but, but he wrote a very interesting article uh, entitled, The Danger of Only Saying What People Want to Hear. And I'd like to read an excerpt from that. It's a little lengthy, but I want you to just listen to it uh, intently, please. Listen to what Becker has to say. He said, the desire to be liked often causes us to say the things we know people want to hear. And there's a danger in that for both the giver and the receiver. First, as the receiver, we only hear the things we want to hear. When we only hear the things we want to hear, we are rarely pushed into areas of needed growth. Criticism can be helpful. And it should be welcome, especially when it comes from the people who love us most. Second, when the voices around us only act as an echo chamber of our personal beliefs, we miss the opportunity to see the world from a new perspective. The first danger of avoiding criticism is just as prevalent as it has been ever, as it ever has been. If we do not surround ourselves with people willing to speak hard truth in our lives, we are left with little opportunity for growth. We ought to value those challenges that those who challenge us in positive ways and also receive their criticism with grace and patience, no matter how difficult it may be. But the second danger appears to be dis disproportionately more prevalent in today's heightened world of communication. For many people, digital platforms have become the new town square. Even more, our digital lives form the foundation for the influences we seek in our life. We follow our favorite artists, authors, entertainers, and thought leaders. This is all fine and good, he says. He says, I'm thankful for the opportunity that technology has provided for me to teach you today. But there is a downside. When we get to single-handedly pick all the people that we allow to speak in our lives, we are less likely to select with people with opposing worldviews shaped by unique circumstances. It's not always easy to allow people into our lives who we disagree with and even more difficult to not quickly dismiss their words when they do. But these are needed for life improvement. Lastly, he says, seek out voices that say things you need to hear, not just things you want to hear. You see, the dangers of only listening to those who we want to listen to or being selective in who we are listening to is that we aren't pushed or challenged in the areas where growth is needed. Secondly, we miss the opportunities to see things from a different perspective, God's perspective. But then lastly, we are less likely to accept truth because we've become desensitized to it. And this is exactly what Paul is trying to communicate to young Timothy, that people will gather around them great numbers of teachers who will only say what their itching ears want to hear, those things that are desirable, those things that are satisfying, those things that are sweet, rather than those things that are necessary for spiritual growth. And ministers and churches across the globe are guilty of altering and watering down God's Word. For example, it's not popular or profitable to declare from the pulpit that every child is formed and fashioned by God in his mother's womb. 
Furthermore, it is a long-standing point and position of the church that all human beings are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, that red or yellow, black or white, we are all precious in his sight. That ideology and theology is eroding from the church. It's not popular or profitable to declare from the pulpit that God made two genders, male and female. It's not popular or profitable to declare from the pulpit that men and women should be committed in a monogamous relationship, that husbands should sleep only with their wives and wives only with their husbands. It's not popular or profitable to declare from the pulpit that we don't recognize same-sex couples or same-sex marriage. Now, don't get me wrong. The church is still the spiritual hospital. So bring your sin, bring your sickness, bring your shame, bring your guilt. But just like at a hospital, when you check in, don't expect to check out the same way you came. We in the church are going to love you. We're going to love, but we're also going to lead according to God's truth and his word. And I've discovered, brothers and sisters, that as a Bible-believing Christian, there are two things that are vitally important. One, you've got to take a stand. And number two, the world needs to know where you stand. I'm going to say that again. Number one, we've got to take a stand. But then secondly, we've got to know, the world has got to know where we stand. And the stand you take is indicative of the relationship that you have with God and his word or the lack thereof. Let me hurry to my text. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 21 and 22 in the NIV, it says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Point number one, God anointed us. He selects us. Um, when I was little, and I wanted to know where, where, where children came from. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, you know, where, where did I come from? And Dr. Harold, my mom told me that um, babies came from the hospital. <laughs> and she said that, that, that there was that, that there's a room that's filled with babies. And she said that, that she and my, 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 my father and my sister went to the hospital to select the baby. And said, they got on one child, no, that's not it. Went to another baby, no, that's not it. But when they got to me, that was something special about me. And they selected me as their child. And for 27 years, I believe that's where children came from. Um, There's something special about being selected, though, isn't it? Um, when you're selected, you're not left out. When you're selected, you're not left alone. When you're selected, the message is you're needed and you're wanted. Um, when you choose Christ, Christ in turn chooses you. He anoints you with his spirit and he selects you for his service. He tells you in effect, he says, you're not left out, you're not left alone, and you're needed on my team. <laughs> See, brothers and sisters, when the early kings of the Bible were chosen, a priest or a prophet would pour the anointing oil on the new monarch, signaling that he had been selected for service. Um, the anointing was an earthly display of a heavenly decision. When Samuel poured the anointing oil on David, the scripture says that from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully. You see, oil in the Old Testament signified God's stamp of approval on a person's life. The oil proved the presence of God. Um, but there are some distinctions 
between the Old Testament anointing and the New Testament anointing. Um, see, in the Old Testament, people were anointed because of the oil. But in the New Testament, we are anointed because of the blood. In the Old Testament, the anointing oil was poured on you. But in the New Testament, the anointing of the Spirit is poured in you. In the Old Testament, you had to meet God's approval. But in the New Testament, if you've been redeemed by the Savior, you have God's approval. The songwriter said it this way, I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has saved my whole life. If anybody asks just who I am, tell them I am redeemed. We are anointed. God consecrated and selected us for his service by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to do anything without the anointing power of God's presence. You see, in 2012, I was, I was nominated by, by, by Senator uh, Gregory Tarver to, to, to serve on the Louisiana Board of Barber Examiners. I was then appointed by Governor Bobby Jindal to, fer, to, see, to serve in, the, in, in that capacity. Um, but, but, but a few years into my appointment, um, I felt the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of my heart, calling me into, into ministry. And I left that position. One of the reasons why I left that position was to be able to be available to do ministry at God's command. You see, I left the appointing to follow the anointing. Uh, a point comes from the Greek word creo. And one of its applications is in doing Christians with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, in doing means to invest or provide. Now, you and I are so valuable in the sight of God that he looks at us and every believer as his personal investment. And the way you determine if you're interested in investing in something is always measured by your willingness to attach your assets. Let me run that by you again. The way you determine if you're interested in investing in something or someone is always measured by your willingness to attach your assets. If you're interested in stocks and bonds, you invest your money. If you're interested in family, you invest your time. If you're interested in learning, you invest your mind. And if you're interested in God, you invest your heart. Every spiritual gift Christ assigns comes from his assets. If you've been given a spiritual gift of service, it's your assignment from his assets. If you've been given the spiritual gift of teaching, it's your assignment from his assets. If you've been given the gift of encouragement or prophesying or leading or giving or mercy or preaching, it is your assignment from his assets. Now, evidently, the Lord sees us as worthy candidates to utilize for his glory in the earth realm because his interest to invest in us led him to attach his assets to us. <laughs> we are God's personal investment. I want you to say that with me. I am God's personal investment. Again, with conviction, I am God's personal investment. It's vitally important that you know that God looks at us as his investment. But like all investments, the question on the floor is, what's the rate of return? <laughs> I say it all the time, brothers and sisters, there are two fundamental things that we're going to have to satisfy when we see the Savior. Number one is, do you know me? And number two, what have you done for me? And when we stand before the beam of seat of Christ, he's going to look at his investment, your life and my life, to determine the rate of return. And I can't speak for you, but when I stand before the king, 
All I want to hear from him is, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I make you ruler over many. Number one, God anoints us. He selects us. He anoints us with his spirit and selects us for his service. Um, but not only does God select us, but number two, uh, secondly, Paul says he put his, his seal of ownership on us. He, he selects us, but then he puts his seal of ownership on us. Um, how do you know the difference between an Apple product or a Motorola? Or how do you distinguish Wonder Bread from Sarah Lee? How do you determine catalogs from great value? Um, it's because the brand is sealed on the product. See, I own, I own a, a 1967 Ford Galaxy 500. It's my favorite car. I've driven it here once or twice. Um, that car was gifted to me by my aunt. It has always been in our family since the day it was made. Um, Dr. Harrell can, can attest these cars, you, you have highs and lows with these cars. Uh, they're up one day and they're down the next. Um, <laughs> funny story, I, uh, a couple of months ago when, in, when the dead heat um, of, this, of this summer, I, I went to a place because my air conditioner is not working in my, in my 67 Ford Galaxy. Now, if you know anything about old cars, you know they're, they're old, they're heavy, and they're metal. And that metal generates heat, and the leather on the inside will generate heat. And you can roll the window down all day long, but you're going to sweat <laughs> like you're working out. And I took my car to this place that in Shreveport that is known for fixing air conditioners. I got there to the place, and I left my car there, and I got a phone call the next day or so, and they said, well, we need some parts, but we can't find the parts for this car. And so, of course, to me, the next, the next best uh, um, uh, option is to, well, let's just do a complete overhaul. Let's just redo the AC unit. So I found a reasonably priced AC unit. I'll tell you about the price when my wife is not in here. I found it, it was reasonably priced, are you? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I showed it to, to the technician. And I said, look, um, uh, you can't fix it with the parts, you can't find the parts. Well, how about let's do a, a complete overhaul? And uh, he, he looked at it and he said, uh, he said, he said yeah, uh, we, we can do it. He said, but, um, but you know, we, we got a lot of work going right here and, and that's going to be a big job. He, he said, um, um, how about this, come back in the winter and we'll install it for you. And, and I was thinking to myself, yeah, that's exactly when I need my AC to be running in the wintertime. <laughs> but in 1967, there were a number of vehicles that were made by various automakers. And the body styles of that era resembled one another. But the thing that distinguished a Ford from a Buick or a Buick from a Chevy, or a Chevy from a Pontiac, was that the automakers stamped their seal of ownership on each vehicle. So that no matter where you traveled, no matter how long you stayed, or how old the vehicle got, it will always be identified by the automaker's seal of brand ownership. Now, since that's true in the physical, how much more true is it in the spiritual realm? God set his seal of ownership on you. And just like that automaker, it doesn't matter where you go, how long you stay, or how old you get, as a born-again believer, you and I have God's seal stamped on our souls. David put it this way in Psalm 139. He says, if I ascend into the heavens, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utter parts of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me and thy right hand will hold me. The principle is, no matter where we go, our God is with us because we belong to him and he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone. You see, when you accept the son, you get the seal. Further, this is the sort of language that you and I should use when doubts about our certainty of salvation arise. You see, some people would have you believe that you can be saved one day and lost another day, saved one moment and lost another moment. Um, but when Christ came to save us, he died on that cross once and he did it completely. And I want you to look at this passage of scripture in, in Hebrews, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 in the NLT, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 28 in the NLT. I, I want you to see how this reads so you can understand your salvation. It reads, verse 24, for Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear before God on our behalf. Verse 25, and he did not enter into heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on the earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of animals. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that the judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins but to bring salvation to all who eagerly await for him. And just as Christ didn't die over and over again, neither do you and I lose our salvation over and over again. You see, once you receive Christ as your Savior, at that point, you are sealed with his spirit until the day of his return. You see, brothers and sisters, we talk a whole lot about the mark of the beast but we need to discuss the seal of the Savior because the seal of the Savior will keep you safe from the mark of the beast. <laughs> you see, in the Greek, to seal is to stamp with a signet or a private mark for security or preservation. God's seal is a sign that we are under contract. See, if you ever go house hunting, um, and you find the perfect little pad. Layout is beautiful. Landscape is perfectly manicured. You love everything about the house. But when you call the realtor with, with, with high expectations, uh, the realtor tells you, I'm sorry, but this house, no matter how bad you want it, is under contract. And no matter what you say, no matter what you do, and no matter what you offer, there's nothing you can do to remove that status because it's already preserved for somebody else. Well, Satan, our adversary, would love to get his hands on you. The Bible tells us that he stands before God accusing us and reminding God of all of our sins. But just like that house, no matter what he says, no matter what he does, or no matter what he offers, God says, you can't have him, you can't have her, she's already under contract, <laughs> preserved for my glory. See, um, I was here yesterday looking over my notes and, and, and putting the finishing touches on and seeking the Lord and, uh, behind what, what, what all should be said and done, and, and, and Sister uh, uh, Beverly and Brother Jerry came, pleasant surprise, um, and, and they came to, to change all of the of the air filters uh, in the sanctuary and, 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 around, and around the church um, to, to make sure that things were, were clean. And you know, the, the purpose uh, of an air filter is to catch all of the dust and the debris uh, in order to preserve the life of the AC unit. Um, the, the filter says to the unit, I'm here to limit or impede 
what gets to you. Um, I'm used as a seal to ward away all the junk that's, destro- that's trying to destroy you. And God places his seal of ownership on us as a constant reminder to the enemy and to the world that no matter what they throw at us, they cannot destroy us. See, 21 years ago, um, my wife and I got married. And um, we, we, we signed this, this seal called a marriage license. And, and in fact, I, I joke with my wife all the time. I say, you know, I own you. Um, this, and I bought you for $25. <laughs> and, and, and this, and this, this marriage license is the seal of that ownership. Um, that marriage license says that I belong to her and she belongs to me. Um, the marriage license is the seal, but our wedding rings are the sign. Now, her sign costs a whole lot more than mine. Um, but, but it is a sign of the seal. And, and, and since we've been sealed by God, uh, it just makes good sense that we ought to show some sign. Um, th- there are some places that I don't go because I have his seal that I'm under contract. Um, th- there are some things that I don't do because I have his seal that I'm under contract. There are some things that I don't say because I have God's seal that I'm under his contract. Um, e- Ephesians 4, don't turn that right now, but Ephesians 4, uh, 29 and 30 says it this way. Uh, uh, Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, here it is, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You see, when you are in Christ, you are sealed with his spirit. The seal signifies ownership and authority. Now, since we belong to God, we ought to yield to his authority because he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. God anoints us, number one. Number two, he set his seal of ownership on us. But thirdly and finally, he put his spirit in us as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. <laughs> Look at the text one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us, and he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. God put his Holy Spirit in our hearts to guarantee those things that are to come. He had already done enough by promising us the spirit at all. Um, The promise of the Holy Spirit is to all believers for all generations. We don't deserve the Spirit. We can't earn the Spirit. But the Lord has given us the Spirit by his own unique power. And the Lord Jesus Christ endowed us with the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15 through 17, look at it. In the NIV, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, it says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth says the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you, and he will live with you and will be in you. Now, the first thing I'd like to establish is that the Holy Spirit is not an it. You hear people saying that all the time, that it, the Holy Spirit, it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is the third person of the Trinity. 
The Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father and the Son. And his responsibility is unique in that he is the one sent to contend with man. You see, through verses 15 and 17, we see four key factors related to the Holy Spirit. First thing we see is that the Holy Spirit comes only as a direct request of Christ. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit comes only as a request of Christ. But secondly, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. Now, an advocate is somebody who pleads the case for someone else um, because they have their best interest in mind. We dropped our daughter off to college two weeks ago. Drove down, let her out. <laughs> She's starting a whole new, new life, new thing. Dropped off on Saturday. Thursday, she calls and says, I'm sick with COVID. And not only am I sick with COVID, but they're telling me that you've got to come pick me up and bring me home because I have to vacate the premise. Well, that didn't make much sense to me. And her advocate <laughs> called down there and spoke to uh, the person over, over housing or, or residential or whatever. And, and I said, I said, ma'am, I said, now, I'm, I'm, I did this for me as much for me as I did for her. I'm going to speak as calmly as I possibly can. <laughs> but this does not make sense. My daughter left whole, healthy, and when she came down here, she got sick on y'all's watch because you all don't have any kind of protocols, no safety guard, no anything. She's sick on your watch. She's at your campus, and it does not make sense that my wife and I have to leave Shreveport to come down there to pick her up to put COVID in the car <laughs> and then bring COVID to the house. It's not like she was deathly ill. She had all her vaccinations, so she was okay, just a little sore throat. But in so many words, I told the lady, ma'am, this is y'all's situation to deal with. And my expectation is that she's housed and that she's fed and that she's looked after because we're paying for those things. You see, without, without, without her advocate speaking on her behalf, she would have been at the house. But because I was her advocate and because her mom was her advocate, we stood in her stead pleading her case until we got the results that we needed. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He pleads our case before God. While the enemy is accusing and building a strong case against us, the Holy Spirit is covering us against his attacks. <laughs> but not only um, is, is, is the Holy Spirit our advocate, but according to the scripture, he's our infinite helper. In other words, his help will extend beyond time and move right into eternity. So that even when you close your eyes on this side of the veil, the Holy Spirit is still with you. Because again, he promised never to leave you, never to leave you alone, and never is a very strong word to God. But then lastly, he is our resident God. He will live with you and be in you. I will never leave you. I will never leave you alone. That means, brothers and sisters, that we are safe, selected, sealed, safe. But the interesting thing about our passage today in 2 Corinthians is that he says he put his spirit in us as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You see, when, when a parent wants to leave their child or their children an inheritance, 
they will outline it in a will or a trust. Um, a will or a trust is a document written during the lifetime of the parent, but is only activated when they die. You see, the will or trust serves as a legal document, as a legal description of the deposit that the heirs will receive. And the Holy Spirit is our resident God, and his, and he, and his presence serves as proof of what is to come. He's our resident God, and his presence in us serves as proof of what will to come. Um, right now, the, the, the Holy Spirit guides us. Um, the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit resides in us. Uh, the Holy Spirit comforts us. He connects us, and the Holy Spirit con convicts us. Um, when, when we experience the power and work of the Holy Spirit teaching, and guiding and comforting us, that is assurance that our faith is legit and we can believe the scripture that tells us of the things to come, things not yet seen. You see, if you are a born-again believer, stored in your account, number one is eternal salvation. John 5 and 24 says it this way, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes me, believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. But secondly, we have stored in our account is eternal freedom. Romans 8, 1 and 2 in the KJV says it this way, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life of Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Stored in your account is eternal rewards. Jesus said in Revelation 22 and 12, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give each person according to what they have done. Eternal salvation, eternal freedom, and eternal rewards are being kept safe for all believers at all times. You see, Paul is saying that the gift of the Holy Spirit is in us and is proof and is all the proof that we need to believe in eschatological events to come. And that's just a big fancy word for end times. God put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Notice the order of things. He anoints us. He selects us. That's for God. Secondly, he put his seal of ownership on us. That's for others to see, both in the spiritual realm and in time. But lastly, he put his spirit in us. And brothers and sisters, that's for us. He selected us for his service. He sealed us for his church body. And his spirit keeps us safe throughout all eternity. Selected, sealed, and safe. All heads are bowed. All eyes closed, please. I'm not sure if everyone in the house this morning is in fact safe. You may be running from the Lord. The Lord is tugging at your heart for you to accept the free gift of salvation that he offers for everyone. And if you're here this morning and you realize that you are not safe in the arms of Christ, I want to extend and offer an invitation to you to accept him in your heart 
as your Lord and personal Savior. What an awful thing it would be for you to leave this sanctuary and something tragic happens to you. And you stand before the king and he doesn't know your name. And right now, all over the room, if there's anybody who says, Brother Craig, I, 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 need, I need Christ in my heart. I feel empty. I feel the void that's in my life. And I need his Holy Spirit to reside in me. I need his life in me. If that's you today, I want you to say this simple prayer of faith. If you're watching us via live stream and you realize that you need to say this prayer of faith, I invite you to join us in. All across the room, if you're not sure of your salvation, if you're not sure if today you die and go to hell, and I want you to say this prayer with me, but not just uttering words, but let it be from your heart. Words don't save you. It's the condition of the heart. Whether you believe that Jesus Christ truly did die on the cross, that he was buried and rose again on the third day morning. If you believe that and you are ready to surrender your life over to him, I invite you to say this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, say these words. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to receive you in my heart. I believe the scripture when it says that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again on the third day. And right now, I invite you to come inside of my heart to be my resident God. I believe in you, and I accept you. Thank you for coming inside of my heart. In Jesus' name. There may be others in the room and say, you know, I, I am a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I, I've been in a backslidden state. I, I haven't been in church. I haven't really connected with a family of faith. And, um, I realize now at this point in my life that I need a group of people with me holding me accountable to love on me, and I love on them, and I learn of the things of, of Christ. And if that's you today and you say, I need this to be my church home, I want this to be the place where I grow and learn and serve, on behalf of our pastor, we would love to have you. Just come and see me at the end of service. And we'll make sure to get you, get you in. I feel in my spirit that we've got prayer requests. I I felt it yesterday, and I feel it even more strongly right now, that there are some needs in the building that you just need the Lord to intervene, that there are some health issues, that there are some family issues, that there are some personal things going on in your life, and you need the Savior. You need his help. And I want to let you know that God is ready to meet you right where you are. He's ready. He's willing. He's able to listen to all of our cares and our concerns. And he wants us to bring all of those things to him. He says, cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. If that's you right now and you just need prayer, I want to invite you to stand. I want to invite you to stand. If there's something that you need to God, 
the creator God to do that only he can do you stand this is your day of redemption your day of salvation your day when the Lord will meet you right where you are I feel it so strongly in my spirit let's go before him in prayer Father, in the precious strong name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name that the scripture says every knee shall bow in the earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord in that name. We come before you, O Heavenly Father, thanking you first of all that you ripped the veil in half when you sent your son that we have direct access to the king of kings and to the lord of lords and we don't need a mediator to go and stand in our stand but we can boldly make our claim before you our magistrate now father you said in your words in philippians chapter 4 that we are to be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, that we are to present our request before God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we stand on the authority of your word. God, go before this body of believers. Let your spirit and your presence be known and felt right now. Mend the broken hearts, oh Heavenly Father. Heal, oh Heavenly Father, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Connect families, oh Heavenly Father, that have been disconnected, oh Heavenly Father. Meet the needs, oh Lord God, of your people because we are bowing before you, oh Lord. We're looking up to the hills that come up from all our help. We know all our help comes from the Lord and we're looking unto the Lord for that help. Father, we surrender to you. We can't solve our problems ourselves. And so we give it to you because you are our King and you are our Lord. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides. Now, Lord, provide. Whatever it is that is needed, Lord, provide. If it's healing, Lord, provide. If it's peace, Lord, provide. If it's provisions, oh Lord, provide. If it's housing, Lord, provide. If it's family, Lord, provide. If it's school, Lord, provide. If it's peace, provide. Provide. Provide, oh Lord. And we glorify you. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your humble servants. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.